This is a special episode of the Stem Cell Podcast, ISSCR Day 2, Dr. Madeline Lankinson. Hey everybody, we are doctors Daylon James and Arun Sharma. Welcome back to the Stem Cell Podcast, where we culture knowledge and stem cell research by talking to some of the brightest minds in the field. Today, we're back with another special episode to discuss highlights from the past 24 hours of the 2021 ISSCR annual meeting, taking place virtually for the second year in a row, unfortunately, but we're making the best of it. If you're tuning in through the podcast app or a podcast app, you may want to head over to the Stem Cell Podcast website or Stem Cell Technologies YouTube channel, where you can find today's episode complete with a video of Arun and I. Arun is looking better than I am today. Today, we'll be chatting with Dr. Madeline Lancaster from the University of Cambridge about her thoughts on the meeting. But before we get to that, a quick message from Arun. I'm learning about addressing drug efficacy and toxicity with human organoid models during stem cells, technology innovation showcase tomorrow at noon Eastern time. You'll hear about liver and intestinal systems and some of the unique advantages of these organoid models. Get your questions answered live at the end of the session or stop by the stem cell virtual booth. Thank you for the compliment, Daylon. But the reality is I lost my contact. So that's why I'm why I'm wearing glasses right now. But different look, mixing it up a little bit. You know what I mean? So you're looking smart. So, I'll tell you that much. Appreciate it. Not something I hear a lot. <laughs> but back to the roundup. So from yesterday, we're talking about day two. We're talking about uh, sessions after the second plenary which is where we left off. Uh, I actually wanted to go to a particular session called Microengineered Human Brain Chip for Disease Modeling Applications. And the reason I wanted to go to this session was a lab mate of mine, Dr. Michael Workman here at Cedar sinai was presenting some of his data on using the organ on a chip technology from Emulate in Inc. to model the gut-brain axis. And he is like an expert in all things gut organoids, recently has gone into more of the brain side of the, the brain side of the field. Uh, but there's apparently a connection in Parkinson's and the disease progression of Parkinson's is influenced by the gut actually and the metabolism in the gut. So he actually wanted to use this organ chip system to study that development of Parkinson's to see uh, can metabolites from gut organoids and gut organ chips actually influence the neuronal tissues on brain chips. Um, So I thought, you know, I definitely wanted to stop by and show a little love to my lab mate. Moving on to the session after that was the Dr. Susan Lim Award for Outstanding Young Investigator, who is none other than Dr. Madeline Lancaster, who we are going to be talking to very shortly. And of course, well-deserved. She is on an absolute tear with all of her incredible science and cortical organoids these days, uh, focusing on everything that she's done over the last couple of years, ranging from coronavirus research to Evo Devo work, comparing the gorilla organoids to the human organoids, uh, the choroid plexus work, the generation of the cerebral spinal fluid, kind of gives you an idea of just how productive Dr. Lancaster has been over the last couple of years. And it is very impressive. She's very well deserving of this particular award. And then moving on to theme session, uh, tissue development and maintenance. Wanted to just kind of highlight some of the trainees and some of the folks in this particular session. It was a very basic session. Uh, first up is Sharagin Tagbash, looking at the skeletal muscle dis- uh, cell dis- diversity and the regulatory modules underlying the, the diversity of different skeletal muscle stem cells. Maria Alcolia biomechanical switch regulating the transition towards homeostasis and the esophagus epithelium. And I really wanted to highlight Shuri Gur-Cohen, whose paper we've covered recently on the show coming from Elaine Fuchs's lab. She's actually going to be starting up her own lab pretty soon and uh, uh, can't wait for that. It's going to be a fantastic um, young investor, young investigator coming down the road. So of course, she focused on her lymphatic story, the impact of lymphatic tissue and skin regeneration. Uh, Next up, Mika Nakayama, understanding a mechanism underlying bone repair through lineage tracing and single cell seek, Irene Yavlinka, uh, hair follicle morphogenesis, and then Emma Rollins, who um, was using lung organoids to study development of the lung. So a lot of great basic science talks in this particular session, looking at the role of the niche and different tissue types, ranging from the skin to the lung. A lot of excellent basic science in these 
heart in really the heart of the ICCR, right? The, the individual concurrent sessions where the trainees really get to get their shine on. Yes. Uh, and a highlight for me too was Shiri Gircon. Um, I mean, her talk was great too, but it's something about a young investigator who's so poised and any investigator that you see in the Q and A, I love a, a master of the Q and A where they get in there and it's like, there's no question that you can surprise them. There's nothing that they haven't thought of. You know what I mean? Uh, so that was really great to watch and it really uh, impressed upon me, her mastery. So I'm expecting big things from her. Other highlights for me was the moderator, Salvador Benita. I thought he had a really great talk just conceptually. That's what I come to the ISSCR for, is to get a kind of glancing blow with stem cell science that really changes the way I think about my own work or everybody's work. Uh, and there, I think it was this idea of the circadian reprogramming. I thought it was a really cool idea. Uh, and especially the idea that the clock is dependent on the niche um, and his whole, you know, deconstructing the hypothalamic and the skin. I thought it was just a really cool idea that makes me think about, you know, in all these organoids that we're working with, what is the role of the clock or the lack thereof um, if we're really failing to recapitulate some, some of the central circuits there. So that was a nice idea. Also, I had to laugh with uh, Miki uh, Nakayama from the Hojo Lab, where she she called out her molecule. Obviously, you know, you got to do unpublished data. So all respect, Miki. But the molecule X thing, I was laughing because I was just waiting for someone in the chat to be like, what is molecule X? Which, of course, they didn't do, but they, they kind of ancillary question, which was like, any idea what targets molecule X might hit? And it's like, come on, give the girl a break. She's trying to keep her stuff under wraps and a trainee, a lot at stake there. So all respect and courage to you there. Um, Emma Rollins, I have to say, I love the idea that it was all human. I mean, that was a boon. That all the work, she said at the end, all this work was human. Um, and it, it's, it really, to me, illustrates the value and importance of using aborted fetal tissue or any fetal tissue. Um, and we can't really do without it. There's like really fundamental insights uh, that we'd not, we'd not really get to without uh, having access to this tissue. So for me, it was a big session. I was really heavy, like you, I guess, in the concurrence that were leaning towards there, away from the NT session, although I did hit a few of those. They were definitely worth um, getting to. Next next day, this morning, actually, uh, moving on to the, the, the next concurrent, um, again, I, I got stuck in the, the tissue stem cell element a little bit bias there but uh, i had to start with uh, emmanuel passaget who's you know she's she's a real big deal in hematopoiesis you know me with the hematopoiesis and i loved her idea she made it sound simple but you know from a, from a baseline in her lab and other labs it, they're working nowadays with these old mice these geriatric mice it's just 24 months it's really hard to do to get a mouse to survive that long and under controlled conditions so Right at the beginning, you know, when that's our first slide, you really perk up to the level at which uh, she's conducting her science, her and her group there. And the fundamental idea there is that there's two prongs there to the, to the I guess, malignancy or deterioration of the hematopoietic compartment. That's the cell intrinsic. These cells are old. All right. 24 months for a, a mouse is forever. Uh, but the other thing that's really, I think, more druggable and treatable is the niche. You know, the old stem cells, hard to rejuvenate, all claims with parabiosis notwithstanding. But the, uh, the, the niche, uh, in her case, she talked about the inflammatory molecules that were governing the niche and, and how that's really treatable and druggable. Um, not perfectly in her case, she conceded, but it was nice to see that some of the, the, the issues surrounding the, the myeloid bias and and uh, deterioration of the hematopoietic compartment with age may be solvable uh, and would make a really big impact clinically. And just uh, to, to segue that into Thomas Ambrosi at Stanford, who is a travel award winner and trainee who uh, is from the Charles Chan lab. And it was a nice segue there, whoever designed the program, because he talked about skeletal stem cells and a very similar idea, how there is this kind of aging effect. And it's, it's, it's really seated in the inflammatory process there. So that was great. Uh, also quickly, Maria Behar from Cambridge had this awesome, um, another trainee had this heterotopic co-culture where she took esophageal uh, tissue and then combined it with the dermis and then like trans differentiated, which was crazy. Um, just visual. 
hopefully as well. Uh, and also, yes, just to highlight Mary Banier, hello. <laughs> Sorry about that. Those Danish names are those, you know, the European. I don't do so well with them. I don't do well with many names, but I, I try. Uh, anyway, you know her. She just came, yeah. dropped that cell stem cell article from the Cleavers lab. You know, the lacrimal, Arun, you talked about it. Remember the lacrimal uh, organoids? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah so yeah, there was that. that was and that was pretty, for me, that was a session. I don't know. What do you think? No, it was, it was solid. I guess we could transition into plenary three, which was all about technologies. We're talking about organoid technologies, the lacrimal gland organoids, all that good stuff. And this was a session highlighting all the cool new technologies in our field and are intersecting with our field. So first up was Ru Guru Wardane, Guna Wardane, sorry about that, uh, who is actually doing some beautiful work at the Allen Institute, looking at uh, the Allen cell collection of iPS derived cells. And you can basically have a whole compendium of fluorescently tagged IPS lines that can differentiate into cardiomyocytes, a variety of different cell types. And not only is this visually really appealing, it's really beautiful to see the functional dynamics inside of a cell at real time, but it's really useful. The, you know, one thing she said was they're generating a quote unquote Google map of, <laughs> of, the, of the cell using differentiated fluorescent reporter IPS lines and 3D imaging. So you can really get a good spatio-temporal feel of how different proteins are moving around in the cell in, in real time. And since this is the Allen Institute, founded by Paul Allen of Microsoft fame, they're going to be able to do an amazing job coupling computation in analyses, right? So if you're looking at real-time analysis of protein mo motion, you're going to need a lot of computational power, and that's what they have backing them up. And also, of course, we had uh, Dr. David Liu, who is not necessarily a stem cell biologist. He is of face editing and genome editing fame over there at the Broad Institute. He gave a talk about his recent paper on base editing of hematopoietic stem cells that's rescuing sickle cell disease. I'm not going to dive into it too much because we actually just covered it on the show. So definitely take a listen to our recent roundup. Uh, but really exciting, clean genome editing there in, you know, no longer needing to use the shotgun based approach of the Cas9, which kind of blows up the genome. This is a more targeted base editing approach. Next up, an old friend of the show, Matthias Lutoff, engineering epithelial organoids on a chip. Again, check out our episode, you know, if you want to get a better look into what Dr. Lutoff is focused on. But really, I thought one thing that was nifty was some of his unpublished data looking at how tumor cells can really rapidly just take over and destroy the architecture of their, their organ chip. That's uh, and just very quickly, it was really cool to see. Kind of scared to see, to be honest with you. And then finally, Tim Schroeder looking at TrackSeq. This is their technology that they can use to spatiotemporally track the, the motion, the transcriptomes of single cells, real-time dynamics again, looking at cell cycle timing, and also daughter cells. They can look at all of these things in an integrated fashion. I think this is something that was unifying this particular session, uh, starting, you know, talking about Dr. Gunnar Wardane's talk and also Dr. Schroeder's talk, the idea of combining multiple technologies to actually get a, a better look into how cell dynamics function. And you can look at uh, transcriptomics, spatial temporal, protein motion, uh, all this stuff ideally at the same time. And for me, this, while the technology is amazing, a lot of it has to do with the accessibility. Ideally, I want to go to a world, I want to be in a world where every lab in my own lab down the road, if I'm lucky enough to start it up, has access to these like multiplex technologies. Because mm. just imagine how much we would be able to learn if we all had access to these amazing techniques, right? Yes, access is the key. But you know, you got to credit the Allen Institute. Uh, they, they've made all these resources publicly available. David Luz puts all this stuff on AdGene. This really is a collaborative spirit among scientists and it really is underscored uh, at this conference. Just a, a brief note, I had to laugh. You said about the Google map of the cell and, and Paul Allen, I'm laughing because you know, Paul Allen, rest in peace, wherever he is, was groaning saying, Google map, this should be the Bing map, you know, Microsoft <laughs> being Microsoft, but probably not, you know, he's got bigger, bigger fish to fry where he is. Um, for me though, just to, to close uh, the, the big star of that session was uh, Tim Schroeder, 
um, who was not only a deft and generous and brilliant moderator, um, but also gave a really impressive talk. And as a scientist, you know, I've been following his career for a long time. I can't believe we haven't had him on the show. I guess maybe it was some misplaced sense of rivalry that I, I was feeling as a, as a fellow blood guy and a little bit of envy, perhaps. Um, but he's a great example of a scientist who's just continued to get better. And, and, and I mean that in the best way. You know, some scientists, they're born in the Nature article, the, the Cell article. They come right out of their postdoc and they're killing it. You know, we know plenty of those people. They're on and they're in this conference. They're on the show all the time. Tim Schroeder is a guy who he came out of the gate strong, but he's continued to get better and he will continue to get better. And uh, I think there's no limit to um, his impact. Uh, so I'd like to be like Tim. I'd like to continue to get better throughout my career. And I think, um, you know, this conference, going to these conferences is, is a great first step. Um, we learn a lot. Uh, so before we get to uh, our interview with Dr. Lancaster, who's taught us a lot this last year with all our innovation, I have a brief message from Stem Cell Technologies. Neural organoids, that's what we're talking about. A lot of neural in this conference. We're about to talk about neural with Madeline Lancaster, neural organoids offer unique opportunities to study the human brain using physiologically relevant and complex 3D models. Stem cell technologies offers tools to allow self-organizing brain development in a dish or pattern to specific brain regions from human pluripotent stem cells. To find out what models would help you address your research questions, visit www.stemcell.com slash neural organoid center. Now, without further ado, let's get on to our interview with a great friend of the show, Dr. Lancaster. All right, you guys, we are here live with Dr. Madeline Lancaster, who hails from the Medical Research Council, that's the MRC, Laboratory of Molecular Biology at the University of Cambridge, where she is group leader of the Cell Biology Division. Notably, this year, Dr. Lancaster received the Dr. Susan Lim Award for Outstanding Young Investigator and gave that lecture. Her research really speaks for itself. I don't need to introduce it. Everybody knows her at this point. If you don't already, we will delve a bit into her research right now. Dr. Lancaster, thank you so much for joining us. What are you thinking of the uh, conference so far? I think it's fantastic. I think they've done a really great job, especially you know, especially having to deal with COVID still and having to make it virtual, but I think they've they've really pulled it together very nicely, and and I'm really enjoying all of the talks and um, all the awards, of course, and uh, and you know just just getting to see some of my uh, colleagues, even if it's just virtually. Yeah, back to back virtual ISSCRs. Hopefully next year it's in person, but we did want to dive a little bit deeper into your work specifically that you've presented, and some of it's already been published, and in particular, the, the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus work. I mean, this is work that's been going on for the last year plus now, and a bunch of different stem cell labs in the field have used different organoid models to study the infectivity of different tissue types in the context of COVID-19. And you actually had that choroid plexus uh, organoid paper showing that the choroid plexus may be susceptible to to infection by the coronavirus. So I just wanted to again, get your opinion, and now that we're 18 months down the road after the start of the pandemic, just wanted to get your opinion on the utility of these model systems to actually study the infectivity of uh, you know, the coronavirus, because there is a bit of a disconnect between what you might see clinically and what you might see in vitro, right? Yeah, definitely. So, and I think one of the key uh, features that probably needs a little bit more attention is just kind of how how much virus people are putting on these different in vitro models, you know, whether it's brain organoids or choroid plexus organoids or, you know, intestinal organoids or lung organoids. I think that, you know, um, thinking carefully about uh, or testing, really, ideally testing different amounts of virus and taking cell types where we know that there's a really high susceptibility in the clinic, you know, so for example, cardiomyocytes, you know, we actually know that there's um, heart damage in some of these patients and actually the in vitro models are replicating that really well and cardiomyocytes are, seem to be really, really susceptible. And the only reason probably that we're not seeing it in more patients is just because, well, usually the virus doesn't make it to the heart. And so I think that's a really good example where the in vitro models are, are really great. 
And so sort of benchmarking what you find in other organoids based on those known, those cells with known susceptibility, um, I think it's going to be really important. Yeah, we talk about, uh, you know, SARS-CoV-2, uh, Zika is another one that stem cells really came in uh, quickly. You were able to act in a human system um, and develop some insights, right? Uh, and so we appreciate the value of stem cells and their derivatives as a model system. Um, and also, obviously, uh, as a means for regenerative therapies, of course. Uh, but your work also delves into the Evo Devo element, right? Um, which I find really fascinating because it's really is as basic as it gets, you know, using this system to try and glean some insight into what fundamentally makes the human brain unique um, and special, I think, uh, with my own bias. But, uh, you know, we're at a stem cell conference, I think, where a lot of the emphasis is placed on the regenerative aspects of uh, stem cells. And, you, you know, you had this seminal work, this, this breakthrough idea and platform where you could really go in any direction, right? And I guess that's why you're doing all these different things. You're doing the modeling, you're doing the regenerative element, you're doing the Evo Devo. Is there any pressure as a young scientist, really even intrinsic, you know, because of your own ambition as like to get your medicine into people or extrinsic from, you know, the funding sources or from the people you admire around you who influence you uh, to, to maybe lean towards therapeutic applications and away from the more basic at this stage in your career? Um, that's a really good question. I think it's um, I, the reason that, that we're doing so much evolutionary work. And I have to say, actually, the, the recent papers that we've been publishing have been, you can see we've done, we've done quite a lot. But I have to say that the, there's always this, the goal is always actually in my lab to bring it back to evolution mm. and to look at really basic questions. And I'm really lucky because at the LMB, um, we're really supported to do that kind of basic science. And we don't, there's no requirement to uh, justify the research based on an immediate translational impact. I think that, uh, you know, they recognize that you can't necessarily predict that kind of thing. And, you know, CRISPR is a perfect example of that, you know. So uh, supporting that kind of basic research is really important. And I'm, I'm lucky to be at an institute where they recognize that. Um, you know, getting, so I have a lot of core funding to support that research, uh, which helps a lot. <laughs> getting external grants is harder uh, to justify that way. I think uh, most granting agencies um, are being pressured more and more to, um, to fund translational research. And, um, you know, there's a place for that, but I think we need to always have funding available for basic science as well. So, um, you know, I'm hoping that places like the LMB can kind of be a light for the rest of the world and kind of show, show the rest of the world that actually, you know, there is a lot of value in basic science. Uh, you know, we wouldn't have monoclonal antibody therapies if it wasn't for the research carried out at the LMB, the basic science research carried out there. So I think, you know, it's important to remember that. And at the end of the day, I just am really genuinely interested in, just like you said, what makes our brain special? Hmm. It's a question that, that, you know, it's been around for centuries probably. And uh, if we can gain any insight, uh, I'd be delighted. Do you find though quickly, just before Arun jumps back in, that you have to kind of lean on some of the, the, the data points? Like I, I and it, it's true, like in relevant, I think clinically that there's like a delay and the timing and the brain, that's what makes it bigger. Do you, do you have to kind of spin that and sell that as not have to, but do you find yourself spinning it and selling it to the people who are interested in therapy being like, and this means this is how we can expand them or something to make it something practical. Or, I mean, do you, are you so well funded and Mac daddy at this point that you don't even care what people think? <laughs> uh, <laughs> The LMB is pretty well funded. So I'm, <laughs> I, I, I'm lucky not to have to do that too much. I mean, for for external grants, but you know, but I don't. Luckily, I don't have to do too much of that. And that's that's another thing that I think that that where the LMB is a really good example. And there are other examples of institutes like that, like Janelia, you know, mm. where people are have this really nice core funding to support them in a key question. And you know, you're hired to work on that key question. You've already justified 
the importance of that question. You don't need to justify it anymore. Hmm. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm lucky to be able to really just genuinely be interested <laughs> in the basic science and I don't have to, you know, I think it's, it would be hard otherwise to justify making gorilla organoids, <laughs> you know, but okay. it's fantastic that I can do that. Fair enough. Asked and answered. I will cede the floor to a room. Yeah, you're living the dream, Dr. Lancaster. We <laughs> wanted to ask you a little bit about, well, since we're talking about the translational side of things, I'm sure you're aware of the new ISCR guidelines that just came out recently. There's been this hubbub about the 14-day rule and whether it's the most relevant time point to look at anymore. And in particular, I wanted to get your opinion on one part of the guidelines that was talking about organoids. So apparently all organoids are now placed under category one, which means this is permissible research that doesn't need to be extensively reviewed. And of course, you know, you're an expert in all things cortical organoids, everything cortical organoids. And there has been certainly some discussion about the maturation of these things and how far we can actually push them along the maturation lineage. And you know, no one likes to use that term brains in a dish, but of course it has come up. So I wanted to get your opinion about whether organoids and cortical organoids should all be placed in that particular category. So what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think that the ISSCR has done a really good job of, um, I mean, the committee that was involved in these guidelines has done a really good job of considering where the current technologies are currently and then assigning them to these sort of categories based on where they are right now. But that doesn't, they've made it very clear that that doesn't prevent things from changing in the future. And that's the way it should be, I think. Uh, science changes, you know. And currently, I completely agree, actually. I don't think that any type of brain organoid currently has any sort of capability to um, place it in some kind of ethical gray zone, to be honest. I think um, I think it was good that they brought in experts on brain organoids to, you know, including Jürgen Knoblich, my postdoc advisor, who I developed this method with, um, to think about or to, you know, bring the expertise and point out what brain organoids really are, because I think there's a lot of discussion about them. But if you don't actually you know, see them in real life, I think you start to uh, think that they are something that they're not. And, um, you know, working with them day to day. And also, I think also coming from a mouse background where I, you know, I used to work on uh, developing mice and, uh, and, and, you know, I used to work with neonatal pups and stuff. And I'm much more comfortable <laughs> with killing my organoids <laughs> because at the end of the day i mean i really i think if you really see them and you really work with them you realize that these are really just blobs of tissue and even if they're neurons just the fact that they're human neurons doesn't mean that they are thinking and and then also having coming from my research background now the development you know understanding development and understanding evolution as well and starting to get, get a grip on what really does make our brains special, because that's what we're worried about. We're worried about getting brain organoids that are as special as our brains, right? But now we know that, you know, I mean, our brains are special because they're just huge. They're absolutely gigantic. And I mean, I think I calculated at one point, if you wanted to grow the number of neurons that you've got in your brain on a bunch of Petri dishes, it would cover the entire floor plan of my house. Like that's how many <laughs> cells you need. So I think we're just like so far away from that kind of thing. And, and I haven't even touched on the aspects of the organization of them and, you know, the necessity, the developmental necessity for it to get input and output in order to get functional networks and, you know, that kind of range of, uh, of developmental plasticity and stuff. So I think there's so much where we're so far away. Um, so I think that the guidelines are, are right, I would agree with them. But obviously, <laughs> we don't know where this technology will lead. And I think it's important to constantly um, reassess it as, as new technologies are developed. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think all these uh, guidelines are provisional, as we've said before. And uh, with the technology moving at such a fast pace, uh, we're going to have to revisit them more and more. Uh, with less uh, lag in between, um, you know, part of the the idea there is to get on the same page and consensus with in terms of like the ethics, I guess, and the, the moral justification for these experiments. But another element that they're trying to emphasize this year at the conference um, during the introduction was stated was equity in science, right? Um, and you uh, were awarded the Susan Lim Young Investigator Award, who was 
a very fine example of a pioneering woman in science and innovator, the first surgeon to, to perform a liver transplant in Singapore, the second female surgeon. And I mean, these distinctions, it's a little bit, I think, painful to have to set apart first woman, first, you know, with Kamala Harris, all these things, you know, um, especially as a scientist where we're talking about our, our intellect, right? But as a leader, as a woman, um, and as a, a young person, a young PI in science, you have, I think, a unique responsibility. Uh, what, what elements of the, that responsibility do you think, um, you know, have you taken on and, and do you enjoy, um, yeah. and, and, you know, what, what are the expectations you have of yourself in that role? Well, I think I try to, um, remember the key, um, aspects of my own career that kind of brought me to where I am and tried to pay that forward. So um, I'll be talking in the Women in Science um, uh, panel on Friday, and I'll be talking about a little bit of this there. But, um, you know, I had uh, a really influential scientist come up to me while I was still a postdoc and um, just tell me how exciting my work was and encourage me to apply for a PI position. And that was huge. That was hugely important to me um, because... I didn't even know her and she just came came up to me and, and you know gave me all this encouragement so i think paying that forward and doing that um you know for other trainees obviously encouraging my own lab members and trying to um support i think support people with diverse backgrounds not just not just you know gender and ethnicity but also just like personalities i think mm. in science there's a certain kind of personality that kind of gets selected for and that has absolutely nothing to do with how good of a scientist you are and so i think that um you know encouraging people who might not feel like they belong for whatever reason um is really important yeah, guys. Well, we'll we'll be sure to catch you in the uh, Women in Science panel. Unfortunately, right now we're pulling you away from the Equity in Science uh, roundtable. Uh, we're sorry about that the scheduling concerns, but we'll catch that on the rebroadcast. And uh, Madeline, thanks so much for joining us. This has been a really illuminating chat. And uh, just before I let you go, just uh, last thing: is there anything that you're really uh, excited? about uh, catching any of the talks or, or, or sessions that you're looking forward to in particular? Well, I've, I mean, I've just really enjoyed the sessions I've been seeing so far. I really enjoyed the presidential um, plenary, for example. Um, I actually especially enjoyed the, um, the movie that was made for um, mm. you know, our outgoing president. And I think that um, that was really fun to watch, actually. That's probably my favorite part so far, <laughs> to be honest. But I've, I've really been enjoying um, all of the organoid and you know neuroscience talks, and, and I'm really looking forward to the, to the upcoming ones. Yeah, Arun and I were laughing uh, behind the scenes about uh, Hans Clever's walking, walking Through the Woods. Yes. That's our, that's <laughs> yeah, our that favorite one. These, these, when you see the scientists in their own element, uh, you get a whole different view. And that's exactly what I pictured, quite honestly. I just yeah. picture him out in the woods <laughs> coming to his glorious insights. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks again. And that brings us to the end of this episode. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Stem Cell Podcast to find out what we're doing at the meeting. And check back here tomorrow for our next episode with Dr. Shaheen Rafi, my man. He's from Wild Cornell Medicine. We'll see you guys then.